Recording will be available on uh, the uh, YouTube channel, on my YouTube channel, which is Dashboard Doctor. So um, look out for that. I'll post it on LinkedIn and stuff as well, or and on the meetup. So if you're missing out, then um, uh, just keep an eye on my socials. I usually post the recording somewhere. Uh, okay, recording started. Let's have a look at some sponsors. So... Uh, big thanks to our sponsors. So first off, we've got uh, Serious People, uh, Donna Bowen. Donna, do you want to say a few words about Serious? I'll bring up your website too. Absolutely. Thanks so much. We are an IT recruitment agency based in Melbourne and Sydney. My whole world is data. I only recruit for data roles. So think data, think Donna. I have a ton of work on at the moment. If anyone's looking for a move, contract, term, fixed term, let me know. But mainly I'm here, I just love the Power BI and DataViz community. Um, I think it's incredible how consistent it is and also the sharing that happens as well. So keep it up. It's good to meet everyone. Cool, yeah. So if you're looking for people in the data space, then uh, I'll give Donna a hoy. Uh, you can find her on LinkedIn. You probably find her through this website as well. It looks like they've got a salary calculator here too, so you can check that out. Uh, thanks, Donna. So Sirius, uh, they do our, they, they sponsor the pizza. So they're not sponsoring the pizza at the moment because we can't get together, but normally they do. So they keep us fed while we talk about nerd stuff. Uh, and Servian. So our other sponsor is Servian. So Servian, uh, we've got Yulin here from Servian. Yulin, do you want to do a sales pitch for Servian? Sure, Servian is the best. <laughs> uh, we are a primarily a Melbourne-based company. Uh, we do plenty of data work in the cloud. So we are Microsoft partner, AWS, as well as Google partner. We also do managed services too. So we deploy a database solution, a data platform solution now we'll manage that for you. We have offices also in New Zealand, Singapore and India. Um, we are HashiCorp um, partner too. We deploy, when we deploy data platform infrastructures, we do it, we do it all by code. Um, that's pretty much us. We have some uh, high profile clients, some big banks, some big grocery shops that we, that we do plenty of work with. Um, we uh, have just tapped into the uh, power platform space, uh, acquired a couple interesting work in the power app and power automate space and we've been doing power bi with our client because of part of that platform for a couple of years for now awesome thank you very much yulin so yeah if you guys are looking for data related stuff then obviously uh servian thank big thanks to them so they normally will sponsor the beer and the venue and they've got a very nice office over there in uh collins place overlooking the city and so we're looking forward to getting back there one day oh can't wait uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Greg Nash. I am a Power Data Platform MVP, which I only just got in December, so hooray. Um, and uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it was a long, hard road, so I'm pretty stoked with that one. It's been an interesting ride. Um, I have just announced as well that I'm doing Power BI mentoring. So if you guys are interested in, so we do two hour mentoring engagements, which are working really well with some of our customers. Like we just sit in, uh, you get me on a team session for two hours. We basically just go through and look at whatever data you want to look at. And so we sign an NDA um, and uh, I help you just work out all of those hard and difficult Power BI things. So I'm going to post a link to the form for those of you that haven't seen it. Um, uh, you can just contact me through via the form. I'm offering a bit of a discount for the first few people that get in as well. So we're just trying to kick this stuff off. But um, this is a great way to solve some of those quest uh, questions you might have about a specific thing in Power BI and you can't find it on the web or you just want to bounce some ideas off people. Um, uh, Power BI mentoring is the way to go. Uh, okay, with all that said, uh, I think we are ready to get into the session. So the session today is, and I'm going to read Sam's little blurb here off the uh, meetup, is around customer analytics, advanced customer analytics with Power BI. So if you want to deliver customers what they really want, if you want to understand your customers and their behavior, so Sam's going to have a look at a Power BI solution that digs deep into the customer behavior. He's going to take advantage of some of the newer features as well. It looks like doing some pretty cool um, advanced analytics stuff on customer. Really, really interesting stuff. I'm looking forward to this one. 
Uh, I've known Sam for a while now. He uh, used to work for me at one point as well, and now he's a strategic mm -hmm. analyst with uh, Red Cross Lifeblood. He's a very smart kit cookie, and so um, I can't wait to hear what he's got to say. So, Sam, you can take over the screen whenever you like and cool. introduce yourself, and uh, I'll shut up. <laughs> uh, that's all right. Thanks very much, mate. Uh, let me just get this set up. There we go. All right. Give me a yell, Greg, when you can uh, see that. Yep. Good to go, mate. Cool. Perfect. Awesome. So, um, yeah, thanks very much for introducing me uh, for that one, Greg. So, um, as you mentioned, that blurb and that kind of setup, we're here today to talk about customer analytics. And there's a number of different techniques that can be built out in Power BI, some of which are really simple, some of which are quite sophisticated. But all this is with the intention of getting more familiar with our customers and being able to give them the offerings that uh, can really help them in their customer journey and keep them engaged uh, with your business. Cool. So a little bit more about me. So um, I'm a self-described uh, Power BI guru. I've been dealing with Power BI for a few years now. Um, as Greg mentioned, I used to work with him as a Power BI consultant um, as well. Uh, these days I work with the Australian Red Cross uh, lifeblood within their analytics team. So uh, within, within our team, we do a fair bit of stuff around uh, not just Power BI, but also I'm getting involved in some stuff with statistics and machine learning and kind of rolling out projects um, along that line as well, on top of just some uh, fun Power BI stuff as well. Uh, me, myself, I'm a certified uh, solutions associate. Um, I'm yet to upgrade that to the data analyst associate, uh, the new qualification that takes that one over, but it's the same exam anyway um, from what I've seen. And then also I'm a Microsoft certified trainer, so I tend to deliver uh, Power BI training sessions uh, for different audiences as well. Um, and besides all that, I also started a blog uh, late last year um, on Power BI stuff. So if you're interested to see some cool little tips and tricks with Power BI, feel free to jump onto apexinsights.net um, and check some of those out. Cool. So for today's session, kind of the overview is we're going to start out by thinking about what actually is customer analytics and what are some of the techniques that can be used uh, when you're trying to understand your customers. And then we're going to go through a bit of a case study. So to get started with that, we'll get familiar with our data set. And then from the visuals that have already been built on top of that data set, we're going to use some analysis techniques to start to get more familiar with what's going on with our customers um, to gather some of those insights. And then once we've had a play with that and tend to understand some of those insights that we can gather, I'll walk you guys through how we can build out some of those, uh, those visuals and kind of the nitty gritty behind each of those. And um, yeah, if there's any questions um, as the talk goes on, feel free to chuck them in the chat. I'll get Greg to kind of moderate that. And if there's any um, particularly pressing things, I'll let Greg, you can just um, clue those out and then just uh, we can discuss them as we go. Yep, I'll butt in. <laughs> cool, that's what I want. Awesome, so let's start out with what even is customer analytics. And in a very kind of broad sense, it's easiest to think about this when you start thinking about how the customer engages with a given business. So typically, a customer will approach you as a business if they are after something, whether that's a good or a service, and they'll typically provide, in exchange for that good or service, they'll provide something back. Now, typically, more classically, this is, you know, they're paying money for that service. But these days, especially when you're talking about, like, you know, big tech companies, you're not always even paying for that service. Like with Facebook, who pays for Facebook? You don't have to, right? And that's because on top of, um, like, for a lot of businesses, besides just paying money, you're also giving them a bit of information about you. You're giving them uh, data, right? So if you're talking about traditional kind of retail, um, on top of actually paying for those goods, you're also giving them information about um, what you're spending your money on, how much you're willing to spend, where you're making that purchase, when you're making it, you know, the seasonality of all that, maybe even how you're making that purchase. So, you know, if you're talking brick and mortar uh, retail, it might be if you're going through the self-service checkouts or the registers, it might be whether you're paying cash, card, whatever. If you're part of loyalty programs, all of that information is stuff that you can do to un that you can unpick to get a sense of who your customers are and what your customers are most likely to want. Um, and that's kind of one of these core ideas within customer analytics. So once you've gathered all that data on on mass about your customers, what you can do, you can do a number of different things, right? So first of all, you can start to identify trends and work out which customers belong in particular uh, groups. So you might find more conventional groups of you know these customers buy in this particular. Um, area in these particular stores, and that's your more obvious ones, but you can get more abstract and start to do um, some clustering, for example, based on common common traits um, of your customers as well. And then on top of that, once you understand your customers a bit better, 
you might hypothesize that certain uh, certain discounts or certain offers might have a better uptake with some customers over others. So you may be better off trying to offer those uh, discounts to those customers. Maybe it's these customers that are at risk of um, moving on to different customers. You know, you see this all the time with, um, say, insurance companies. If they're trying to keep you around, you might be able to get a better deal. So when you understand a bit more about your customers, you might prefer to offer them certain discounts as well. Um, and once you're able to provide those, I guess, preferred offerings to your customers, what it can lead to is the customers stick around for the long term. If they're sticking around for the long term, they're going to be contributing uh, more money to your business over over time. The, I guess, lifetime value of that customer is a bit higher, and that can, that can really boost uh, your performance as a business as well. Um, and I'll also point out as well that this stuff doesn't just apply to conventional kind of customer um, customer based businesses. So for my work at Lifeblood, we don't talk about customers, we talk about donors, but a lot of these techniques are equally relevant um, in that case as well, because we've got a number of different, we've got um, you know thousands of donors coming to our donor centers at Lifeblood, um, and we can use these similar kind of techniques to understand what's useful to them as well. Um, I'll also point out that if in the course of this talk, I ever, I ever start talking about donors, I probably just, it's probably just a force of habit. So just think uh, customer if I happen to let that slip. Um, cool. So there are a number of different techniques that you can use within the customer uh, analytics space, and, and pretty much all these can be done in Power BI. So one of them is around this idea of a cohort analysis. So when we talk about a cohort, what we're typically referring to is a group of customers that have some common trait about them. And the most conventional uh, trait is around when they started engaging with your business. So this is particularly relevant if you're talking about a subscription-based business, maybe when their subscription first started. And you might want to see, um, you know, how long those customers stuck around or see common trends um, kind of staged out for each of those groups of customers. But you can also base your, uh, your cohorts off of different metrics. So you might base it off customers that are involved in particular promotions and seeing if the promotion has an effect on their long-term engagement with the, with the business. Or it might even be based on um, groups of participants in a study, especially if you're doing like A-B testing. You might want to see the difference in um, certain measures around that as well. Um, so cohort analysis is a really powerful tool. Um, on top of that, there's also things like customer retention and customer churn. So trying to understand over time which customers stick around and how long they tend to stick around and also which customers you're tending to lose. So if you can categorize those customers and understand what is it about those customers that are sticking around and what, about, what is it about those customers that aren't, then you may be able to provide offerings that can uh, flip that trade off so you're keeping more customers than you're losing potentially. Um, we've also got spend analysis. So this is where you, you want to understand for your customers um, how much they're spending, what the patterns are in that spending. So maybe certain customers are more engaged in certain times of year. So this is where you might want to start thinking about um, providing them with certain incentives to, to be buying from you um, at those times just before they're likely to buy. So then in that case, they might buy uh, more or more often. Um, so that spend analysis is a really important piece that ties into this. Um, and then that can also be expanded even further to market segmentation. So um, a common one, um, a way of segmenting your uh, customers to try and understand these kind of collective behaviors. One of these common ones is say in marketing space, you often talk about things like uh, RFM segmentation and that stands for uh, recency. So how often the customer's coming in, frequency, or I should say recency is how recently, frequency is how often they're coming in and also the monetary value that they're contributing. So we kind of touched on that a little bit with spend analysis, but getting more sophisticated, you can add in additional metrics and build out profiles of your customers. So those customers are coming in fairly regularly, but they're not spending as much. That has a different kind of weighting to how you might treat those customers to the ones that don't come in very often, but they spend a lot. So you can categorize donors based on that. And then you can, beyond that, there's even more advanced ways to do things, like especially if you're going into um, like clustering techniques, if you're talking about machine learning with um, like K nearest neighbors to try and build up uh, common traits on, you know, maybe a dozen or more different measures. And then from that, you can build personas to describe uh, your groups of customers. Then there's also things like basket analysis. So um, I imagine most of you guys on the call have probably uh, subscribed to some kind of um, streaming service, Netflix, Disney Plus, anything like that. Um, and you usually find that once you start uh, viewing a few things on any of those uh, different services, it will start recommending things you might also like. So this is kind of the main idea with basket analysis. It's typically around finding uh, correlations and trends between what different customers are buying or consuming and then seeing, okay, well, we've got a number of different customers who tend to watch these kinds of movies together. 
maybe if you're part of that group, we should offer you some of the movies that are seen by people in that group that you haven't seen yet. So um, that offering can be much better to keep people engaged because, you know, if you're on Netflix and it was just suggesting random films or movies or TV shows that had nothing to do with what you're interested in, you probably wouldn't stick around as a subscriber for much longer. So if you can provide those offerings of things they might be interested in, they might stick around for a bit longer. And then going even further, you can go into the predictive analytics space. So especially if you start to bring in things like uh, Azure Machine Learning uh, pipelines into your reports, or if you're using like Python or R um, scripts to do some predictive analytics. So this is where you might want to um, build out some forecasts for your customers, for your, your sales. So you might actually build up an individual prediction how much each individual customer is going to spend, then aggregate that up into a forecast. Or you might even tie it into these other techniques, like say like you, with your customer churn, you might want to predict when your customers are going to stick around and how long until they're likely uh, to drop off as a customer. So at that point, you might want to um, predict when that point will happen. And then just before it, you expect that it will, that's when you might offer some other intervention to keep them sticking around a little longer. So there's a whole slew of different analytics techniques that you can do within, um, within the whole Azure platform, but especially within Power BI. For the sake of today's talk, we're just going to focus on a few different ones that can be utilized just with, you know, standard SAR schema and some um, some DAX measures as well. So we're going to focus on this cohort analysis. We're going to focus on some customer retention pieces and then also some spend uh, analysis. Cool. So and just to introduce our data set. So I uh, built up a report that we'll be looking at today. And this data set is based on data provided by the UCI uh, machine learning repository. So this is a retail data set. Uh, there's about a million records in the initial data set, but this retail data set, this describes a uh, UK based uh, online retail and they had sales between uh, 2009 and 2011. Uh, so this particular retailer, they mainly sell uh, all occasion kind of giftware. So they have a lot of folks around those holiday periods and a lot of the customers, there's a bit of a mix there. So some of these customers, uh, you know, it's a direct to, direct to consumer transaction, but in any case, in many cases, there's also wholesalers involved as well. So we can see some differences involved um, with the sales performance there. Cool. So I'll just unshare my screen and then I'll reshare my Power BI screen. If I can get that up. There we go. Awesome. So what we should be looking at here is our basically our fact table and this fact table um, this fact table just describes pretty much the data that gets pulled out of that data set so in this data set the initial data set had about a million rows but this one um, that we've filled that i've filtered in power bi only has just shy of eight hundred thousand, and that's because for the sake of this uh, customer analysis piece we're concerned with um a cert, like not all of these transactions so we're not too concerned with the returns um, that customers have. So this data set also contains instances where customers have returned goods. There's still some valuable insights can be gleaned from there, but it's kind of outside the scope of what we're looking at at the moment. And then also we've removed uh, information about the transactions from customers who haven't logged a customer ID. So this might be uh, for an online retailer. If you've checked out as a guest, then there won't be a customer ID associated with that because we can't really pull any trends um, out of that information. So we're just looking at those customers where we have a customer ID uh, against them there. Um, and the level of granularity that we're dealing with, uh, this is an invoice line item level. So each record here represents um, a line item on an invoice. So um, say for this first invoice, uh, the first line they purchased these pink cherry lights. They got 12 of them for $6.75 um, and they sent them, um, they're from the UK as a, as a um, customer as well. Uh, so one thing I'll also point out is even though this retailer, this data set came from the UK, um, I've just labeled all these prices at dollar signs just to make it a bit more familiar, even though in reality it's actually pounds. It makes it a bit easier to talk about if we're talking about dollars. Um, and on top of that, we've also got information about the, when the invoice was placed in terms of the dates and times. But then for our purposes, what's most key here is about having the customer, the customer ID, and then also what our cohort they're part of. So in this context, when we talk about cohort, we're talking about what was the first month that these uh, customers started buying from us as well. Um, so that's the structure of the fact table. I've got this laid out as a bit of a star schema here. So it's a fairly simple star schema where we've got our fact table for our invoices down here that we just looked at. We've also got a 
date dimension along the top, which is again pretty standard. And then we've got our customer dimension. So that's uh, just a DAX calculated table that just aggregate, aggregates some information from this invoice details table as well. And then you also see there's some disconnected tables um, that aren't part of this actual schema. They'll come into play with some of our visuals um, once we actually start building them out. So let's actually jump into the report page here. Awesome, cool. So this is our report page where this has combined a number of different elements um, that we can use to analyze our customers. I'm just gonna centralize this a bit so our DAX formula doesn't get in the way. Cool, awesome. So there's a few groups of visuals here. I'll just go through these kind of one by one and then we'll have a bit of a play and see what kind of insights we can pull. So on the left-hand side here, this is again our kind of classic uh, cohort analysis visual. So anytime you wanna see trends of groups of customers over time, this is a really key visual to allow you to show that information. So along the rows here, what we're looking at is the cohort or the first month that each of our customers started buying uh, from us um, as a business. And then along the columns here, what we're looking at is how many months has been since their first purchase. So in this first column, this is saying how many customers purchased for the first time in say December of 2019, and then this is looking at their behavior one month after that, two months after that, three months, et cetera. So this is one of the tables that actually relies on one of those uh, disconnected tables in our model. Um, so what we can do with this is we've actually, got, uh, we've actually got a switch measure built in here. So we can view a number of different measures uh, for this uh, breakdown. So instead of at the moment, just looking at how many customers started and then stuck around over time, we can also see this expressed as a percentage. So this helps us with our customer retention and our churn so we can see how many customers we're losing and how many customers we're keeping over time and we can see if there's any seasonal trends within that and besides that as well we can also see for each um for each customer group and for each month what was their average spend per transaction so you can already see there's a few um there's a few kind of peaks in that heat map there which could be interesting to investigate um, and then on top of this cohort analysis i've also built out some uh, some visuals here around some tool tips. So one thing when you're first getting used to uh, cohort analysis is it can take a little bit of time to get used to what each uh, what each cell in this table represents. So I've actually built out this uh, tool tip visual here, which actually kind of spells it out. This is especially helpful for when you're trying to deliver this to an audience that may not have as much data literacy as yourself. So for example, when we're looking at this current cell, um, along the rows, we're looking at the month of July 2010, but then in the columns, this is the second month after that. So this is spelled out in this tool tip where it's the cohort's performance in September of 2010. So then we say that from the initial cohort of 186 customers, and you can see that from that first column of that, of that row, um, we had 34 of them or 18% that made that purchase in September of 2010. So we've had 18% of them stick around. And then we can also see that from those remaining customers, uh, they spent about $276 on average in that month, and that's a little bit less than the average customer two months out from their first purchase. So these kinds of these kinds of things which you can build with your smart narratives, they can be really helpful for telling a bit of a story and making sure that um, people within your audience can really wrap their head around what's going on um, with the visuals rather than just being numbers on a page for them. Um, cool. So that's on the left hand side. That's our cohort analysis piece. Hey, Sam, can you just quickly mm. take us through that switch measure? Just show people how you've implemented that. Yeah, well, what I can do, I'll actually, I'll take you through that. Do you mind if I take you guys through that a little bit later? Because I'm just going to walk through some analysis that we can do and then we'll get into the nitty gritty a bit later. Is that all right? Yep. Yep. No worries. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's definitely on the agenda. Um, cool. So on the top right hand side, we've also got some uh, visuals around customer retention. So I built out some measures as well that look at for each month, how many new customers do we have? So that's this uh, solid blue line at the bottom. And that just corresponds one to one to this uh, first column in this pivot table here. So you can see that uh, we've got 955 customers in December on the first month. And then if we look over to this chart, we see the same number represented for those new customers. So it gives us another cut of this data as well. But on top of that, we can also see some other measures around our returning and our recovered customers. So when we're talking in this context about returning customers, uh, what we mean is a customer who bought from us as a business, both the previous month and the current month. So that's why in this first month, we don't have any returning or recovered customers because in this data set, the first month is December uh, 2009. 
So we can't explore that too much just yet. Um, but then the following month, we do have some returning customers. And then when we start talking about recovered customers, what we mean is customers who have bought from us in the past at some point, but then they've had some period of inactivity and they've decided to come back and make another purchase from us again. So then if we go to the third month in that data set, we start to build up some recovered customers as well. So we've got this, uh, these three measures represented both as a stacked uh, line chart here. So we can see this top line uh, sums up to give us that total number of customers that buy from us each month. And then we've also got this represented as a percentage kind of proportionate breakdown. So we can see how the trends vary over time. So you can see um, from this data set, the way that this is set up, it's mainly, we're mainly seeing new customers or at least in the context of the fact that our data starts in 2009, these appear as new customers. So there's plenty of customers that may have made purchases before December 2009, but because this is the OS that we've got our data, they're represented as new customers here. So in practice, when you're implementing these kinds of cohort, um, these customer retention visuals, it can be useful to kind of limit this to um, say, starting from the second year of data, if you've got it, for example. But this kind of illustrates that over time, it'll reach this kind of hopefully, it'll reach this natural equilibrium. And then any variations from that, you can kind of dig into and understand. Um, and then in the bottom, what we're looking at is around the spending habits and this kind of spend analysis. So um, this visual here gives um, some fairly basic analysis around what was the total spend from all of our customers in every single month. So you can see that um, there was a bit of a peak in the, uh, the bar charts around November. Um, that's usually, that'd be associated with the uh, Christmas and the holiday periods as well, especially because we're talking about a giftware retailer. But then this line chart also shows what was the average spend per transaction here as well. So you can see there's actually a bit of a peak, uh, especially around December. So even though we had less spend overall, we had less customers, um, they were spending more per transaction overall. So these might've been the customers who um, are just getting in as much as they can because maybe other retailers have run out of stock. So they're trying to get as much as they can for the meantime. And then this final visual here on the bottom right, this is actually this is actually quite valuable because this shows a histogram of our average monthly spending distribution. So what we mean by that is the bars or the columns of this visual represents uh, buckets or bands of customers who have a different uh, average monthly spend. So if we hover over one of these, what we can see is we've got 1,095 customers who on average spend about between $300 and $399 every single month. And you can see that this, this uh, visual, it's fairly concentrated around these kind of lower spend amounts, which is fair enough. You usually get a lot of people um, in this kind of Pareto distribution way where you get a lot of customers who are making a lot of small purchases, but then you get a small number who are making quite large purchases. So then you can see that you get um, this tail that extends out further into the wings. And that's we can also understand the relative value of all those customers with this line chart here. So this is showing for each of the customers in that bucket. So these customers who spend, in this case, between $800 and $899, this line chart shows us for those customers how much they've contributed um, to the overall revenue of the business. So you can see that whether a customer spends eight or $900, you've got a fairly similar amount um, that they've contributed over, over time. So that suggests, again, that you've probably got more customers that are in that lower amount. But then we can see this extended out um, a bit later on. Um, so that's kind of what we're dealing with here, where we've got a number of different visuals. And what's useful is we can kind of dig into some of the trends that we can see uh, within, um, our, within our customer's data set. So we can start out by just looking at individual cohorts here. So if we look at just say the December 2009 cohort, we can see that we started out with 955 customers. So that's, that's quite a lot. Um, and it's quite a lot more than many of the other months later on down the track. Um, but as I mentioned before, that's probably going to also be a symptom of the fact that we don't have any data going back before December 2009. So any customer is going to be viewed as a new customer there. Uh, we got a question from Richard. Richard, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, yeah. It's just a kind of a, a high level one. So mm. uh, I'm actually uh, I'm actually with Southeast Water, a water oh, yeah. company, obviously. Um, I have worked with ARCBS also. So the, the thing about a water company is a lot of this whole thing about customer retention, et cetera, you know, sort of return, all that kind of stuff almost becomes meaningless mm. because at the end of the day, we, 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 we have an area that's, you know, given to us by the government. And I know the ARCBS or I... 
I think they're in a similar situation in that there's not a, some commercial entity, you know, nipping at your heels trying to steal, <laughs> mm. trying to steal customers away. From yeah. You. So, and I, I think the cohort analysis is all really interesting. But I'm, I'd be interested to know is there is there other aspects to this that you've used in your essentially non-commercial context that have been of interest? Mm. Yeah, like it's a really good question. Um, I would say that this kind of analysis, it's not necessarily just tied to customers or even individuals. Um, like, I mean, don't get me wrong, yeah. we do use these kinds of things sometimes when we're describing donors as well. But even if you're not talking about individual donors or customers, there's other ways you can apply it. So for example, I built out some reports where you're looking at say appointment bookings. And you might wanna know, instead of the distribution of when you're opening, or when you're getting uh, customers coming in, you might wanna know the distribution of how long it takes for appointments to stay open. So for us at Lifeblood, um, we deal with appointments and oftentimes when you deal with appointments, um, you don't necessarily open up the floodgates for all your appointments straight away because then you can get some people who can book in for appointments, you know, months out and then they don't even show up. So you want to kind of sometimes taper that profile of appointments that are coming in. And you can use techniques like this to try and understand that a bit better. So instead of talking about uh, cohorts and then months out, you might be talking about, um, uh, you know, individual appointment days and then saying, you know, how many uh, appointment slots are open um, you know, zero days out, one day out, two days out, et cetera. Or you might base on different measures. So you might say, you know, for us, um, um, for us at Lifeblood as well, you know, if you're looking at individual appointment days, you might say, um, if you're looking at individual days going forward after a given appointment, you might want to know how many, uh, you know, donors are rebooking and coming back in. And so that measure is around how it tracks from a point in yeah. time. So it kind of gives like a, a way to spread out things in appointment time. So, and it doesn't have to be tied to, you know, individual people, for example. Yeah, for, from a water context, some work that I did for one of the uh, water companies was around cohort analysis on the age and type of pipes. Mm. So depending on um, okay. how often they break and how much maintenance is required, they were using it for budget spend analysis into the future so that, you know, in a kind of predictive maintenance way. So you could have the same thing for um, suburbs that you had call outs for your maintenance workers, et cetera. So that's something that yep. you would look at. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah. a really good one. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I like that one. Thanks for that, Michael. Yeah, so there's there's a number of different ways that you can apply um, these ideas without it necessarily being tied to customers, as long as you're looking at things in a point in time and you're kind of seeing how things shift over time. Yeah, and, and you've got me thinking, I can see now, you know, I mean, like we have similar concepts like, you know, because we do actually go out and service things and especially um, tied into, uh, you know, Michael's point around pipes and that, you know, if you get called out maybe to a whole, you know, to the same area a lot, you know, then you might ask the question, well, hang on, is there is there something wrong with one of the main lines or something? So thanks for your mm. answer. That was great. Yeah, no problem. Cool, awesome. So, um, so we're looking at um, our cohorts and we're trying to understand a little bit about what are the patterns here. So we can see that for this first cohort um, of customers, uh, we see that there's actually a fairly consistent trend um, over time. So you can see that if I get the tooltip out of the way, we can see that uh, the customers aren't dropping off too much. We're having a fairly good retention there. And we can actually slice this. If we select this individual cohort, we can see how each of these measures look for this one cohort. So we can now see that, of course, all of our new our new customers come in in that first month. But then over time, uh, the total number of customers, it fluctuates a little bit, but it doesn't seem like it's trending down. It looks like it's staying fairly uh, steady there. And then this, uh, this visual here kind of shows that breakdown that most of our customers from this cohort are the ones that are sticking around with us, you know, month on month. Um, say in this case, we've got up to 70% of them in December. And then you've got some that are still, you know, coming back. Um, maybe they're taking a break, they're coming back. And then you can also see kind of the change in this average spend over time, which we could also view if we looked at this switch measure. Um, and on top of that, we can also see the spend distribution. So you can see that for this cohort, there's probably some customers here, probably just a couple that are having this good average spend amount. So this is where um, you can set up your reports to kind of drill down into those customers and identify them and work out which of those really high value customers. And for those, that's where you want to be you know, offering some really um, some really good either discounts or 
um, offerings to make sure you keep them around so that they're going to um, you know, keep contributing with you for years to come. Um, so that's our first cohort here. And you can look at some different trends along these cohorts. Um, you can see that certainly there's fewer customers coming in um, in that second month because you can see that the heat map's a bit less saturated here. So that might be cause for concern for us, for example. So oftentimes a lot of people, the main measure they might care about is you know, their revenue or their profits, for example. And we do see that for the profits over time, it's fairly steady outside of the Christmas periods, but then it ramps up a little bit. And if you see that trend happening year on year, then you can easily be on autopilot and think, oh, there's nothing to worry about. But then if you were to look at your customer retention metrics and then see, well, actually, our spend habits are staying the same, but most of the spending isn't coming from returning customers, it's mainly coming from new customers if it happened to shift that way, then that actually opens you up to a bit more risk as an organization. Because if you've got lower customers that are consistently contributing, say you don't even have any, like even if you don't have any new customers, they're all regular customers, you can have more confidence in that, those sales continuing over time. But if you've got a really high turnover of your customer base, then that can be cause for concern um, because if you have one bad month, then that could have a lot more impact than if you had a reliable customer base there. So that's how you can kind of dig into this and peel back the layers of what's going on with your customers so that you're not necessarily, um, you're not necessarily opening yourself up to risk there either. So also there's some other trends we can see from this chart as well. If we look at say the customers retained as a percentage, right? So now we're looking at this as a heat map again, but we're representing this as the number of customers who have stuck around um, after a few months. So here in this first month, after this first cohort started, 35% of them stuck around out of the total of 955 overall. And then individual cells here, we can see that of this cohort, December 2010, we had seven of them or 9% that stuck around um, up till July of the following year. And there's a few kind of trends you can see here just from the heat map. So first of all, there's a bit of a, a discrepancy in the, the darkness of the, of the values here. So you can see that customers who started buying in December of 2010, um, we had a fair number of them. How many did we have? We had 76 new customers come in. And that's probably not as many as in November because for this, for this group of customers, we're mainly dealing with wholesalers. So they're probably gonna wanna get their orders in a bit ahead of Christmas. But then we see the retention's not that great. So we can see that drops to 9% um, in the following month um, in January. But then that stays fairly low over time. So it's staying in the you know 10%-ish area. But then for these customers that started in December of 2010, if we look at, there's actually been this uh, bit of a peak where the retention has doubled. So um, we've had twice as many customers come back in this next month as the prior month. Um, even though it's only 15, it's still 20%. Um, so that can suggest that these kinds of customers, um, that they probably tend to buy a bit more seasonally. So they're most interested in buying around that Christmas period. So we might want to offer them, uh, you know, targeted communications in uh, October. So they're primed and ready for that. Um, I think, did you have a question, Michael, as well? Yeah, thanks. Um, so in terms of uh, customers and, and retail, is it mainly kind of marketing interventions that they'd What's the sort of actions that they would take on on seeing this information? Yeah, like it's a good question. Like there's a few different there's a few different actions you can take, right? So marketing is the obvious one where you can say that if a, if a customer's part of a given cohort, then yes, they're probably going to come back seasonally. So let's hit them with some communications before then. But then um, again, as we mentioned before, it can help speak to the the risk of your um, customer panel as well and seeing about you know. If you've got a lot of turnover in that, that can be a bit of a challenge. Um, as, as I think you mentioned before, around that example of using this kind of analysis to understand, uh, say, the longevity of different interventions, or not interventions, but different pipes that are used for water, that might actually give you enough uh, evidence to say that, okay, custom, um, pipes that we installed over this three-month period, they tended to only last, you know, I don't know, three or six months. Most other periods, they lasted over 12 months. Like, I don't know if that's the right time scale for what you're talking about. But if you had that kind of clustering where in a given month or a set of months from when you first uh, installed the pipes, that there's a bit of a discrepancy there, that's not really a marketing thing, but that does warrant further analysis to say what's going on um, with with those pipes. And it might be down to, you know, a wholesale who provide you some, um, some, you know, some dodgy materials, or it might be, I don't know, say a union strike. And then those um, those workers didn't put in as there weren't as many uh, you know 
workers to put in the effort to make sure that it ticked all the boxes. So besides just doing the interventions there and being proactive, it can also allow you to review what happened um, with customers in that period and see if you can apply those learnings to kind of future interactions. Perfect, thanks. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, so besides this, um, this behavior around these customers in say December of 2010, there's also some other features that we can see in this heat map. So there's this kind of diagonal line here in the heat map as well, this kind of striation where their customers tend to stick around, say these customers from March, they're sticking around up until November and then they're dropping off from 28% to 11% retention. And then we find that because each of these diagonals correspond to the same sales month, um, so this diagonal is talking about November, the following one here will be talking about December, we can see if there's something going on around that November period. And given the context of, our, of this business, it's probably referring to that seasonality of uh, the customer purchases. But if you tend to find other seasonalities going on, then that can be cause for concern as well. Um, and you can look at this to see if these trends kind of last over time. So for these customers, we're showing data going out to 12 months, but um, because the data set goes two years out, you can kind of see there's some common patterns if we extend this out to 24 months. So for these customers that started earlier on in their journey, it kind of builds up um, to give a bit of a darker, um, a darker area on this heat map along this final line here. So it's interesting that these customers who first started buying in December 2009, Two years later, they're picking up from you know 30% to around to around what was that 40 41%. So there's a bit of an uptick there. So sometimes this can be indicative of seasonality, which is fairly natural. But if you tend to find other patterns, then that could be cause for more investigation. And that's part of what we can see as well if we look at our average spend per customer. So as we were talking about before, this is showing for each customer what was the spend for those customers for each month. So you can see again here that there's a few uh, high points here. So for example, in this cohort of customers, we had an outlier where um, the customers started buying in December 2010. Two months later, they were spending on average $1,400. And as you see in the tooltip, that's 240% more than the average customer in that time frame. Now, in this case, that's only, what, four customers or 5% of that total that started. But that's a big difference from the average. So that suggests that there's probably one of our either an uh, important wholesaler in there or something interesting that we might want to dig into even further. So this is the kind of power that you can get out of these analyses. And this is just looking on the surface. This isn't even without digging into it uh, in detail. Um, cool. So that's a bit of an overview of some of the analyses that you can do with some of this stuff. What I want to show you guys as well is how you can build out some of these visuals. Um, so for example, when we're building out these uh, cohort analysis visuals, the typical, you know, your best friend for this kind of thing is usually just a standard matrix table here. So the way that I built this out is on the rows, I've again used the cohort, um, the cohort or the first month these customers bought from us. And that's actually lying at the in the fact table rather than in the uh, customer dimension. And that becomes important if you want to slice down these other visuals that are doing other separate calculations. But then when we're doing the columns here, we're actually using a separate table. So this is our our period out table, which is just defined here. And actually, if I look at that in the data view, so this is our fact table again. If we look at our period out table, this is literally just a list of integers from zero to our 23 months out. Um, and that's not connected in our data model. That's not connected to anything in our star schema. We're just using our measures to be able to define how that interacts to give us the numbers that we get that are different for each column. So if I jump back to the customers measure, let's actually dissect how this is put together. So if I jump to our customers measure here, I'll bring up the DAX. And the way that we build this out, this is actually based on a technique that I got from, I think it was uh, Parker Stevens in BI Elite. I think he did a video a while back on how you can easily do some cohort analysis. There's a few ways to do it, but this is a fairly straightforward uh, DAX uh, bit of code to implement. So the first uh, thing you want to do is you want to basically identify what cell of this pivot table you're talking about. So for the pivot table, here we're looking at customers who first bought in April of 2010, but then we want to know what were their sales in July of 2010. So this first uh, variable here in our DAX measure, this tells us what's the current uh, cohort just by the selected value that's contained in the row here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to step that month forward in time based on how many uh, periods out we've got selected. 
So we use that with this EO month function. And the definition here is it just returns the date um, of the last day in the month um, after a specified number of months. So we're saying start with, in this case, I think we had, what was it, you know, April 2010. And then in this case, step it forward three months. And that's going to return this current month value here. And then what we do from there is it's fairly simple. We just calculate how many customers we had from the unique list of customers in our fact table. But then we use calculate to just change the filter context here. So by default, this will filter down um, to just the customers that are in this cohort, because remember that this this uh, the values on this column don't have any relationship to that fact table there. But we're going to effectively add in some filtering based on that using this term here. So we're going to say we want to filter this down based on the end of the month um, from the date table, and that's that's joining on or that's relating based on the uh, invoice date. And then we're going to say just give me the uh, transactions for those customers in that month of July, so three months forward. And that's going to fill that down and give us the different values for each of the sales in our pivot table. And what we also find is that whenever we've got a month that's too for, far forward ahead in time where there's no transactions, it's just going to come up as blank here. So we can do some conditional formatting to make that come up as blank. So what we can also do from there, once we've built out our customers measure, is we can also use our customers retained. And the customers retained is just pretty much just taking that value as a proportion to the overall one. So if I bring up that measure, we're literally just taking the customers measure that we've already defined, and then we're just dividing that by what were the total number of uh, unique customers that are contained within this cohort. Because remember, because we're in the context of one cohort selected at a time, it will automatically be carried through here without having to apply that in the actual DAX measure. So these ones are fairly straightforward once you get your head around them. Once you start to get into average spend, it can get a bit trickier, but we'll see if we can go through this and make some sense of it. So just as before, we worked out what was the uh, row of the pivot table and then what was the effective column or the month of the transactions. That's just as we had before in these variables. And then we've got a few virtual tables that we need to iterate over. So the first one, we're just taking our invoice table and then we're going to filter that to only include transactions from the current month. So I'm sorry, not only from the current month as in the cohort, but the month that we've got selected in the columns as well. So this is saying for the customers in this pivot in this pivot cell for the matrix, what were the just the invoices for those customers in that month? And that's what we've got by this filter statement here. And once we've filtered down to just the transactions that are uh, related to this cell in the matrix. We're also going to summarize that. So we're going to group this up based on not just the invoice line level details, which is what the original fact table has. We're going to aggregate this to work out for each invoice, what was the total uh, amount for that invoice. So all we have to do is just use a SUMX measure where for each of the contained invoice line items, for each invoice, we're going to work out what was the quantity times the price, and then we're going to take all those values and sum those up. So this kind of stuff is especially important once you want to do this kind of dynamic calculations. It's oftentimes fairly straightforward to do this, um, you know, as an as a pre-aggregated table. So you might have like a, a um, like a like a table that has all of your header details, and then you might have a one-to-many relationship to the line level details, which is what we've got in this fact table. But I find it a bit more valuable to do this as um, these iterative calculations. First of all, because um, it takes you a bit of DAX and get a bit more familiar with it. But on top of that, it gives you a bit more flexibility if you want to cut your data a little differently. So if you wanted to take this a little deeper and do some analysis of particular product groups, maybe do some basket analysis, then it would be a bit, it would be a bit hard to work out these kinds of measures if we had the total invoice amount hard coded in there. So we couldn't dissect that and work out what's going on with just the purchases or the products that we're interested in. But anyway, we've got this virtual table. This just iterates over all of our invoices and works out the total amount. And then from that, we're going to take those invoices and we're going to work out what was the average of the invoice total. So we have to use this um, iterator function here. And this is because we're dealing with a virtual table rather than, um, rather than a table that's contained within our model. Um, so that's how we do this here. We've got a few iterated measures, but this actually runs fairly fast. Um, and on top of that as well, with these three measures, what I've also set up is this switch measure here. So for anyone who hasn't dealt with a switch measure before, all this is, is this allows you to change what measures represented in a visual just with a slicer like this one here. So if you're setting up this kind of thing, 
the way that you set this up is you have a separate table in your model, um, which I've got in my model called measure selection. And then all it's got is the names of the measures or the names of the slicer options that I want to have on the top of the screen. And then I've also got a sort order on them. So I want to have them appear in this order rather than alphabetically. And then the way that I set this up to appear in the, in the pivot table here is I've got a separate measure called, I've just called it switch measure here. You can actually see this um, in the values for this pivot table. And the way that we define this when it comes up is it just uses a nested uh, if statement or a switch. And what that does is that just works out what's the selected value for the measure name. And by selected, we just mean what's selected by the slicer. And then we just say, if the selected value is customers, then I want you to return a customers measure for this switch measure. If it's customers retained, then return the customers percent measure. And what becomes important as well is to format this appropriately. So by default, if you just return the measure value, even if customer percentage is defined in your kind of data format as a percentage, it will often get returned as just a decimal number. And that's because DAX doesn't really like to deal with um, you know, different data types in the same kind of visual. So what it will do is it will force all those values to, to a text type to keep it all consistent. But what you can do is you can define that so that it appears as a percentage with the percent sign. And same for your average spend to make it show you know, dollars here. And it's also fairly good practice as well to kind of add in this error term. So that if you're building out this switch measure and someone makes a selection they shouldn't be able to. So for example, they select both of these at once. I actually just change this to show you what that looks like. So if I turn off single select and select multiple of these, what the pivot table will do is it'll actually drum roll, it actually kind of error out. So it'll actually show that it's not, it's not useful to show that data. So it says just please select a single valid measure to display. So that's another useful uh, little tip you can use for um, you know, making sure your measures are displaying appropriately. I got a question from Luke here, uh, Sam. How scalable are these DAX measures using this particular method? Um, well, it, it, dep it depends what you mean, like how, how involved those measures are, right? So if you're dealing with simple measures, like in this one, it's just counting your customers and your customers retained, that's not too bad. If you've got quite complex measures, like your average spend, it can get a bit more involved, but that's typically tied down to um, how long it takes for this individual average spend measure to evaluate. I haven't noticed any big difference with these, but then again, I'm, you know, very rarely am I dealing with, you know, tens of millions of rows. Like I'm often dealing with millions, but not, not often tens of millions or more. So I can't necessarily say how it scales in that regard, but it can also depend on, you know, how many visual elements you've got in here. So if you found the performance might start to cause you an issue, um, say if you're dealing with 20 million rows, then you may choose to take a few techniques to optimize that. So you might either limit how many uh, records you're showing here at once, or you might even you know, go in further down the line and you might take your measures into DAX Studio and try and optimize those a little bit further. So it just depends on the scale which you're dealing with things. I, again, I haven't noticed too many issues, but if you're dealing with bigger data sets, it can present other issues for you as well. Um, cool, so that's setting up the switch measure. Um, the, uh, some of the other features we've got in here are around the smart narratives here. So this tool tip here, this involves a bit of code to get set up. Um, and it's not something that can it, that you just bang out in one go. It usually involves a bit of iteration. So the way that I've got this uh, tool tip set up, it's just a custom tool tip page where I've got two separate, uh, two separate text boxes here. So this first one's fairly simple where it just says cohort sales performance in, and then just tells you what the selected uh, month is based on what part of the pivot table you're in. That's fairly straightforward. But then once you try to get a bit more involved, especially once you start talking about these branching narratives, then it can be a little tricky. So um, what I mean by the branching narratives, if I jump back to the report page, is that depending on what kind of cell I've got selected, I might want to show different text here. So if I'm showing this first column and I'm showing the tooltip for that, we're talking about customers in their first month. So we actually don't need to provide as much information because the rest of the tooltips are referring to uh, the sales uh, and the customer retention for a given month relative to their first month. But because we're just talking about the first month, there's nothing to really compare to. So in this one, all we're saying is we had 186 new customers in this month and they spent this much on average. But then this is where we get the branching involved where once we're talking about uh, once we start talking about future months, we want to compare that to the initial state of that cohort. So that's another kind of fork in the road for this logic. 
And then as well, when we're selecting uh, some of these later months, we don't want there to be, you know, random gaps in, in that narrative. We just want to say, please select one that's relevant that has that we have data about our customers. So if you want to set up these kinds of things, the way that you can set it up is you pretty much have to use a single measure that contains all of your logic in there. You can kind of nest the measures if you so choose uh, to make it a bit simpler. But if I actually bring this up and we'll have a look at this, where is it? Our tooltip text. You actually see there's a fair bit going on here. And I don't want to um, overwhelm everyone and go through every single detail of this, but I'll just kind of point out the key strokes of this. So uh, the first thing is, um, and I'll bring up our main page again so we can see it in context. Cool. So the first bit of logic is to say, if we're selecting a cell where there's no customers or it's returning blank, then just tell us that we don't have any data, um, select another cell basically. So that's this first line here. That's the first bit of lot. That's the first kind of fork in the path. And the other two that we're concerned about is whether we're talking about a new customers or rather the first month of their purchase, or if we're talking about the returning customers here. So that final bit of logic is just realized by checking, are you talking about the column that's indexed at zero? If so, return the text for new customers, otherwise return uh, the returning customer text. And I could change how this is all set up um, or the order of all of these evaluations to optimize this a little better, but this this works just fine uh, for what we're looking at. Um, really cool. It looks good. Yeah. Cool. Cheers. Thank you. Um, so the key bits of logic that I've found when you're doing this kind of natural language generation with the smart narratives um, being the inbuilt tool with Power BI uh, these days is that you do have to account for some differences in how the text is presented. So if we look at, say, uh, the tooltip here, we can see that for this cohort of customers, those remaining customers spent $305 on average in that month. And that's 200, or that's, sorry, that's 25.9% less than the average customer who's, who spent however much. So that less than or more than qualifier can become important if you want that narrative to make a bit of sense. So you can build out some logic in here where you just say, let's look at what this sign is of that spend difference, with the spend differences being what's the average spend in this cell versus over the whole column. And then if that value is a positive value, then return the text more than, if it's negative, less than, otherwise just 0% different to, I don't, I don't know if there's many cases that happens to, so I'm not too concerned to make that more robust, but that usually has you covered in most cases. Um, and then on top of that as well, you can also see um, in that the last few lines there, we can see that we're spending less on, than the average customer who spent uh, $412 in their second month. So that's two and then the ND there. So you need to also build out some logic to consider those variations when you're talking about, you know, first, second, third. So here we've just said, check what the column value is that's selected. If it's one, then spit out um, ST or ND for the rest of them. Um, it's If you've only got a sm small number of different values, it's fairly straightforward to do. If you're making this, a, you know, if you're talking about hundreds of different values, you need to consider all the different variations it can get a little tricky. And that's where some of your other um, natural language tools can become important. So maybe if you're using like ARIA and LG, for example, they have tools like that have some custom functions that have this built in there. But if you're just doing this based off your standard Power BI Pro license, then these kinds of functions can have you covered as well. So you might have to custom write these out. Um, cool. So uh, we'll also have a bit of a look before we finish up on some of these other, me these other measures to define uh, these visuals. So if we're talking about customer retention, we've got our new returning and recovered customers. The new customers are pretty straightforward to calculate um, because again, these new customers, it's the same logic as working out this zero index column. So we're just saying, uh, what's the current month in this visual? So this is stepping through each month that we've got sales for. And then it's saying, just filter down the invoice customers for that current month. That's based on the uh, first sales month there rather than the actual month that the purchase was made. Um, so that's, you know, pretty similar logic to this one here. Once you get, start getting to returning and recovered customers, it gets a bit more involved. So let's step through that. So for your returning customers, what becomes important is how we define those. So these returning customers are those that have purchased from us both in the current month. So if I select this visual, I might be talking about customers who were bought in March of 2010, but they've also bought in February of 2010 as well. So it's the intersection of those two groups. So the way that we do that is we have to work out what's our list of customers who bought in the current month, just with values here. 
And then we also need to work out what were the customers who bought in the previous month. So the way that we do that is instead of using calculate to change the filter context of the measure, we're actually going to use calculate table to change the context for this virtual table of values. And the way that we do that is we start with our values table. We're going to remove the filter on end of month, which is just from our selection here. And then we're going to apply a new filter, which just says, actually, give me the uh, invoices from last month. And that last month I've just got as a field from our date table or our date dimension that just says for each date, what was the date that corresponds to the end of the prior month? And it just flows through that way. And then once we've got those two lists of customers, we need to do a bit of an intersect operation. So this is like the uh, middle of a Venn diagram for two um, overlapping uh, circles. And then we need to find the customers that fit in both of those lists. And then from there, we just have to uh, return the count rows there as well. Okay, I've got two questions. One of them's from yeah. Meg. It says, uh, this is such a silly question, but how do you get your tooltip text measure to appear in a text box? Is that a multi-row card or what are you using there? Ah, uh, so that's as in, so I take it that's to get this uh, this whole page to appear. Does that sound about right? I'll take silence as a, yeah, sure, it must I'll be. I, maybe, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, so if you want to get these kind of pages to appear, the standard way that most of your visuals represent or bring out the tooltips, um, you've got this type option here in the formatting pane for tooltip. So by default, it'll show them just as this default view. So if I hover over it now, it's just going to show them like you're used to seeing with these tooltips here. So what you can do is you can set up these report page tooltips. So I've got some separate pages here that refer to different um, different visuals. So I've got another one here that was a bit of a prototype for month tooltips. So if I hover over here, I've got another report page tooltip that just basically pulls out a table value. Um, or sorry, it pulls out a table of measures and what they return. Um, that's this month tooltip here. But then I can go even more advanced and make that into this smart narrative tooltip. Um, if you want to make these tooltip pages actually work as tooltips, when you're on the page for it, you actually need to do a couple of things. Uh, the most important thing is to actually go to page information and turn on tooltip. Um, but in practice as well, you probably also want to change the size to something that's not your standard size, but a smaller one like the tooltip size there. Um, yeah, and the, the yeah. classic thing is it takes up a lot of memory, right? So just be careful with your tooltip yeah. pages. It's got to render that whole page. I think, right. Meg, what, what Meg is talking about is, though, how do you implement the smart narrative in the text box? So how do you get that ah, measure in the, in the text box? Yeah. Right. So if I want to set this kind of thing up, um, once you're using um, a version of Power BI that has the smart narratives built in, so I'm not sure when it came in, maybe September or whenever it was, but if you're using a version of Power BI that has that covered um, or has that feature as a preview feature, then you can build these out. So the way that you can do that in this case is I'll just create a new text box. It's kind of gone over the edge of the page, but that's fine. And then instead of just typing this like I might usually for a text box, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tick on this value option here, which is part of this smart narrative. Um, and then all I have to do is basically say what measure I want to return. And I've already got all the logic for that measure built into that tooltip text measure. There we go. And then if I've got that selected here, all I actually need to do in practice is go save. And what that's going to do is that's going to evaluate this measure in the context that's being provided for us. So because we haven't got any customers selected or filtered by default on this page, it's just returning the value um, that we say when we don't have any customers. If I go to my main page here, hoping it doesn't make a wire out of me and actually works, this new visual. So if I, and if I change that back to the smart narrative tooltip, uh, where are we, tooltips? Yep, so you can see that text is represented in both of those as well. So what it's doing is um, it's very similar to when you have a drill down page where it's working out what were the filtered values that you got selected in the visual element that you're drilling down on. But instead of drilling down to it to a separate page, it's just showing that in a little pop up there. So because we've got this cell of you know February 2011 cohort two months out, it's feeding those values in to that uh, measure that's been used for the tooltip and then populating that with uh, the narrative. Yeah, cool. Well, awesome, thanks. And I got one more uh, yeah. just for, for beginner people. Uh, why do you have plus zero at the end of your 
uh, measures? Ah, uh, yeah, good question. So, um, oftentimes when you're dealing with measures, the way that the measures evaluate is it starts by filtering all your values down to consider what's remaining um, in your data set. So what I mean by that is if we look at this particular cell and we're counting our customers, um, in practice, there's zero customers that actually shopped with us in July of 2011 or that started shopping with us in July of 2011 but bought from us in January 2012. That's because we don't have data into 2012. So in our data set, there's no records remaining. But the way that the measures evaluate is it doesn't return a zero row for that. It doesn't say there's zero customers. It will by default say there's blank customers because uh, it just hasn't found any records there. So if you want to actually return instead of a blank here, you want to return a zero, then you can actually just tack on a plus zero onto the end of your measure. So we'll actually see if we can do that just very quickly. If I just add on plus zero to the end of customers. And let it populate. Should actually show zeros on these cells here. There's always the fun with live demos. There we go. OK, so it shows zeros here as well. So there are many use cases where you actually want to see instances where there were zero cases of something happening. Um, fortunately for us, um, it's probably more appropriate to make that kind of blank there as well. Um, but yeah, that's a bit of a pro tip. If you ever want to simply change it to make a null value appear as a zero, you can just add plus zero on the end. And that does, I think it does like an implicit type conversion under the hood. I could be wrong about that, but that's all right. Cool. Um, so back to our returning customers. Um, I think we already covered the returning customers where we just take the list of new, uh, or sorry, the customers from last month, uh, this month and last month, and then find the common ones. Once we want to get to our recovered customers, gets a little bit involved as well. So just as we had in the last measure, we've got our list of customers this month and last month. But for a customer to qualify as a uh, return or a recovered customer, we need to also consider which are the customers that were new because a customer who hasn't bought from us last month but has this month, it could be because it's their first time buying from us or it could be because they've taken a bit of a break and then they've come back. So to work this out, we need to start with a list of customers that bought from us this month. We need to subtract out the ones that didn't buy from us last month because if they bought from us last month, they're a returning customer. And then from this list of customers who bought this month and last month, we also need to make sure that we're not including any new customers. So that's what we've got with these accept operations here as well. And that's kind of another kind of Venn diagram uh, operation there. And just as before, we just count the number of uh, customers that are returned there. And then on top of that as well, if you want to go deeper into like churn analysis, you can use similar measures uh, to work out how many lost customers you had each month as well. I got, I got something in this model that caters to that as well. Um, cool. So those are these measures here. These visuals are pretty much the same. It's just that this one's represented as a stacked bar chart. Uh, column, your yeah, line chart, and this one's a 100% stacked column chart. But once we start getting to the trends here, um, the spending trends, this total spend measure, that's pretty, that's a pretty basic one just based on our sum X measure. It's actually fairly simple compared to what we've already seen, um, which is this guy here. So we're just going through all the invoice and working out quantity times price and adding all those up. For our average spend measure, this is saying for all the customers that's, that bought anything in December 2010, no matter when they started buying, this is the average amount that they spent. So if we want to start getting to that kind of level of sophistication, um, it's actually, again, fairly simple where we're just grouping our invoices, working out what the uh, total for each invoice is, and then averaging that overall. So that's kind of what we've seen before. The tricky thing comes from when we want to do this kind of distribution here. So again, this distribution becomes very valuable if we want to identify um, our really important customers or the ones that are contributing the most. Um, you can actually see that as well, like just for visibility's sake, I've kind of shrunk this down to only include uh, average spend amounts less than $4,000 each month. But in practice, there's actually a fair few more. So if I expand this axis out, we actually see this goes a bit further. So in this case, we've actually got one customer who spends, I think like $27,000 with us every month. And overall, they've contributed about $600,000 to us. So this is one customer that you especially don't want to lose because if you lose you know, $600,000 potentially over two years, that's, 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 a, that's a big impact. So if you can keep that just one customer happy, that can, keep, that can result in you know, keeping your customer base stable 
um, rather than focusing on these individual customers that don't in and of themselves contribute very much. So that's where this kind of analysis can be really, uh, really key. So just so we can visualize this a bit better, I'm just going to shrink this down again. And then if we want to build out this kind of histogram view, um, this is similar to what you might do with, say, banding or binning um, of visuals to build out histograms. I've got a post on my blog to go through how you can build out histograms as well if you want to learn a bit more. But the basis for this uh, visual is around using um, another disconnected table at the bottom, um, which is our average monthly spend. So that's what we've got in this uh, spending histogram table. And if I look at how this is actually defined in our model, it's literally just a list of spend amounts from 0, 100, 200, all the way down to, I think, about 50,000 or so, because um, we didn't have any customers buying any more than that. Um, and then the way that we define our measures is we think of our bin width as being not just customers who spent exactly $500, but between, they're actually ones who spent between $500 and $599. The way that we define that is if we go to our measure, just want to make sure this is the right one. So our average monthly one here. Cool. So this logic does look a little hairy as well, but we can just dissect it by looking at each of these variables. So this first variable just tells me what bin I'm looking at, what's the selected value in the histogram axis. And then this second little bit of logic, um, you don't need to worry about too much. This just says how wide is that bin? So in this case, it's just going to be uh, $100 uh, across. So if I change the bin width and said, I want to consider this down to buckets of $10 rather than 100, this would dynamically update to have that accounted for. But anyway, once I've got those histogram uh, columns and bin widths defined, all I need to do is I just take my invoice details, and this time I'm going to group it not based on each individual invoice, but based on the customer ID. So for each customer, I want to work out what was their average monthly spend. Um, and in this case, it's across all customers, but I could filter this using the uh, cohort uh, cross filter on the side there, and this would all flow through exactly the same because this is a, a dynamic measure. But anyway, so to work out this average monthly spend, we need to start out by working out what was the total spend just with the sum X measure like before. And then we're going to divide that by the unique number of months that they bought from us. So what's important here is this is working out for each customer, what was their average monthly spend just for the months that they purchased from us? So um, one customer who might have had one purchase of $1,000, they would appear in the same bin as a customer who bought $1,000 from us every single month because of the way that this is set up here. So that can be an important distinction um, that you may want to change for the way that you implement this. But that's how I've got it in this visual here. So once we've got this virtual table that works out uh, what was the average spend per customer, we pretty much just start with that table. We filter it down to the customers who have that spend amount between the start and end values of that bin. So between you know, $200 and $299. And then we just count the rows that are returned there. And that's how we get our histogram our access value there, or the column values, I should say. And then also, if we want to show what was the total amount that each uh, customer contributed, that's what we've got the line chart for. And this is our total spend uh, measure, which is coming up here. So it's pretty much the same measure, but we also want to return what was the total spend that the customer had. So we don't just want to divide this by how many months, but give the total spend. And then we're going to take um, our filtered table that just has the customers that fit within each bin, and then for those customers, we're going to dynamically sum that up using this sum X measure here as well. So as I mentioned before, one of these really valuable things to get around is these iterative functions because they can help you do a lot of powerful logic um, without having to hard code any of this data. So this is uh, something that really helps to get, get familiar with. Um, cool. So we've kind of gone through a lot of these visuals and how you can build these out. And we've already explored a little bit about you know, what are the insights you can glean for these. So, And this is just a subset of some of the things that you can do within customer analytics. So we've looked at cohort analysis, we've looked at customer retention, and the spend analysis. But you can take this even further, you can dig deeper down into you know, your basket analysis. You might want to slice this on product, for example. But this gives an example of how you can build out some of these views and do some investigation, hopefully to engage other people in the business with things like you know your smart narratives here, to get them to really dig into what's going on with your customers, or in the case of some examples we had before, what's going on with you know um, products that you're working with in your organization um, that are that are used at different times, and then really dig into those even deeper. So, you, and as I mentioned before, you can apply these to other things outside of customer analytics, as we as I've done at Lifeblood. But 
um, that's kind of all I wanted to go through here uh, now. So uh, thanks very much, and I'll open up to any other questions that you all have. Woo, 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 woo. That was good. Thanks, mate. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, if you've got I've got one question that I didn't butt in for, but I figured we'll talk about it at the end. Jugdish yeah, asked, are you going to share at your PBIX file? Um, I haven't got the PBIX file shared as yet. I've got it. Um, I've got a copy of this kind of published up to my blog so you can play with a little bit. Um, I might share the PBIX file once I kind of build out some aspects of, you know, some blog posts to describe some of this because mm. I'll admit that looking through all these measures all at once can be a bit of can be a bit overwhelming. I'm not going to deny that, but I want to potentially build out some blog posts to explain these in detail. Um, I think they should yeah. subscribe to your blog to be able to get I this PBIX file. Well, yeah. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, subscribe to the blog or... Um, add me on LinkedIn. I advertise them all the time whenever they go up. Um, so yeah, check it out. There's some good posts on there. Yeah. Very good. Well, uh, give Sam a bit of love in the chat. We can't clap, so I'm just going to clap for everybody. <laughs> Yay! Uh, but or or pipe up, say say thanks. Uh, that's yeah, a great it was, session. It was really awesome. Re really well spoken. Um, I love seeing all your clean DAX and all your variables. Is really really good example for everyone and. You know your stuff, well done. Yeah, yeah. Cheers. Like it's, I, I find it quite important to do that clean DAX because otherwise you can't really, you know, you can't interpret what's going on when you've got to go back and dissect it. Um, so yeah, if if you guys are trying to learn how to do some nice clean DAX, the way that I find it easiest to do that is to develop stuff in DAX Studio, and then from that you can just click on what the the form the DAX formatter, and that'll kind of teach you the best practice there to read it all out. And then once you start doing that, usually you start doing it without even meaning to. You start indenting. Um, just to make it more readable. Yeah, I'm going to post a, a post a link to DAXformatter.com as well. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves DAXformatter. Uh, I've been posting, as you've been going and mentioning blogs and bits and pieces, I've been posting those in the chat. So we've got the histogram blog there if you need a link to that. We've got the uh, DAX cohort analysis from BI Elite that you mentioned. Yep. Um, all of those awesome. links are in the chat, guys. So if you haven't been watching the chat, uh, jump on and grab those links. We've also got a link there to Sam's blog, uh, the Apex Insights. And so uh, go subscribe uh, and uh, learn from Sam. Like I said, he's a smart cookie. See, told you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, next month, we have some customer stories. So we're going to be doing like, I think we've got a housing company. I think we might have some finance people. It's going to be great. So we get to see how people are actually, so the um, one person I'm talking to is talking about how they went from uh, Microsoft, like they, they implemented Microsoft and they all had Tableau and they had to move from Tableau to Power BI. So if you're in that Tableau to Power BI space, uh, definitely get on top of that. So keep an eye out for that. Also, like I said, we're all going to the pub soon, so uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, I uh, am doing the Power BI mentoring, so if you're interested in getting some mentoring or you want to build this cohort analysis and you just don't even know where to start or whatever, then get in touch with me. And um, other than that, I think that's about it, guys. Oh, it's going to be a big year. It's going to be a crazy year. So once again, thanks, Sam. Um, uh, if anybody's got any questions, we will hang around for a little bit. So mm. don't feel like you, um, you have to rush off, uh, happy to stay and have a chat. Feel free to, uh, unmute your mic. I'm going to stop recording in about 30 seconds. So if you just want to have a chat off recording, then feel free. Uh, I posted the link to the dashboard, Dr. YouTube as well, that this is where that, uh, will go up. I'll also pop up links on linkedin and all the other various socials and all the rest of it so i uh, keep an eye out for that and then i'm sure sam um will get a copy to you as well man so you can pop yeah. it on your blog if you like awesome cheers uh and yeah nice one uh thanks everybody for coming and we'll see you very soon can we build this in the next diad session <laughs> yeah. yeah why not why not well yeah it's, it's funny because i initially built this out to see like what kind of stuff you could deliver in a training session so you know if, you, if you're looking for those kind of advanced insights i don't see why not yeah yeah go for a diad advanced yep. advanced session with advanced analytics on customers mm. i like that idea mm. um all right i'm stopping the recording yeah do it